I think mainly it's that uh, guys sort of live very hard and they uh, it's a hard life. surrender themselves to just the art, which is, is in a way, it's understandable. You know, so I mean, what's the point in living to be 100 if you don't do anything in life, you know? But when I look at some of these great people like Vic Dickinson. There are some marvelous trombone players, obviously, but I always prefer to listen to Vic Dickinson. such sly wit and such original variations on melody and of course his, his, his pulse was just, just extraordinarily uh, accurate. like Vic, and of course you could name all kinds of people. And they're, they're not known to all but a few aficionados and collectors in this country, better known in France and England and Japan. And many of them unsung during their lifetime. Now Vic lived at um, 1312 Stebbins Avenue, which is, became later on the house that Jazz built when we set up our um, community center in the Bronx. And I can remember doing chores for Vic on, on the weekends, on Saturdays, washing his windows and doing other things around the house for a dollar. Rudy Powell, who's sitting here next to um, Oscar, his son and I went to PS89 together. Let me see. I remember, but I had, I had forgotten Sonny because uh, I ran into him down in a repair shop. And I asked him, you know Rudy Powell? I said, yeah, I know Everard, too. Well, the only one guy I know Everard as well is me. We later moved up on the hill where Lucky's was, up on 149th Street, up on Sugar Hill, where all of the great musicians lived at. Hey, watch it. Don't pass the tap all this time. Whomp, whomp. Henry Red Island lived right. right around the corner from us on um, Freeman Street in the Bronx. Henry Red Allen? Yeah. Remember him? Red Allen. I used, to, I used to love to go hear him. I never played with him, but I used to love to go hear him. He was at a place called the Metropole, a very loud place, and they'd all be standing in a long line on this bandstand. Most people saw him as a showman. He, uh, he would shout during numbers and, and, and get the crowd involved and all that stuff. Yeah, Sister McPartland and Whoever he knew in the audience, it was, he was such fun. He came from New Orleans. He had broken in with his father's brass band. He was one of the few trumpet players of that age and that background who influenced modern players like Miles Davis. And Miles had a lot of respect for him, but most people didn't know that because all they saw was red whomping and, well, how do you used to put it? Whamp, whamp. The showmanship, he was extraordinarily shy and very correct, always in suit and tie, no matter what time of the day, you get, as you can see in that music. That's uh, Pee Wee Russell. Russell. It's so remarkable to, to look at this picture, because I listen to the music of these musicians uh, throughout the week. The other night I listened to, for instance, Henry Allen is here, one of my favorite color players of all time. And uh, the music of these people 
continues to live, continues to be a permanent part of our lives. The spontaneity is what makes the music so continually fresh. And while you can listen to a, a Louis Armstrong or a Lester Young record that was made 30, 40 years ago, and you don't think of the passage of time, it is the immediacy of what that person was thinking and feeling at the time. And for one incredible moment, soon, every eye was, was into that, or every one but, but one. I don't think that anybody, including Art, realized when he hit that shutter, really quite what he had done. First of all, it was something that would never happen again. You know, you can wait around and hope, and you'll never see the likes of this again, and that's what it was about. One of the things that, that, that I learned about movie directing from Art in this shot is that finally, you don't tell everybody what to do. You let them do what they're going to do naturally, because that's what's going to work. Look how young Sonny Rollins looked. And Mingus looked young, too. I think of all the, the, the musicians I've known well, Mingus was by far the most interesting, because he was so protean. He had so many changes. Hey, Rodney. Don't stop now, man. Hope you don't mind. I just walked in. Liberty Hall, be right with you. Not only in its music, which was one of the things that made it so compelling, but he himself. Uh, you never quite knew the kind of mood he was going to be in or why. He even would change shape from time to time. When he was bloated, he'd suddenly slim down and a whole new set of clothes and hats. There's one of my favorite bass players, Charlie Mingus. Charles Mingus. Charlie didn't like to be called Charlie Charles. He had this enormous immediacy of presence. And he had no patience with his musicians when they just coasted. I see you got here first. Yeah, baby, and I'll be the last one to leave. <laughs> he wanted them to play his music the way he wanted it played, but then he wanted them to take out of that music their own kind of feeling. And he would stop performances in a nightclub and say, no, I don't want to hear that. That's, I heard you do that before. I want to hear, I want to hear something new. Uh, and that was, he was a, a very open, open guy. My man Charles. Where's this other bass player friend of mine? Milt Hinton? Milt Hinton today is much heavier than he is in this picture. Um, you can't tell much about Jerry Mulligan because he's at the back there. Hank Jones looked at this picture and he went through every one and he said, now his stomach is twice as big as it was when this picture was taken. And you know, he mentioned Dizzy and all these people. What did he say about me? <laughs> he uh, said you looked exactly the same. Ah, oh, he wouldn't say that, sweetheart. And I think the horn probably is a, at, a, at a more acute angle than it was. <laughs> uh, but I mean, he's a fine player. Uh, horse silver, uh, his weight is approximately the same. He never gets any heavier or any, you know, he stays very much at the same uh, weight level. I eat vegetarian or semi-vegetarian. I eat a little fish, uh, vegetables, fruits, uh, uh, fruit juices, vegetable juices, herb teas, and things like that. But uh, I'm not a diehard, you know. Um, uh, once in a while, I'll get a dream, I'll have a dream about a steak, you know, and I'll have this dream and I'm eating a steak and it's tasting so good, and the next day I get up and I go out and buy me a steak. Horace, has this ever happened to you? Three or four o'clock in the morning, you're dreaming, and this melody comes into your, your, your head, and it's so beautiful, you think, and you say, oh, I'll remember that, and I'll write it down when I get up in the morning, and the morning comes and it's you gone. You lose it, it's, it's gone. gone. Oh. Well, Horace, oh, man. this happened to me once, and I said, I'm going to get up. I got up and I went down to the studio and said, I'm going to put it down and see what it is this time. And I wrote it down and I went back to bed and I said, in the morning, I'll get up and develop it. And when I got up in the morning, I went back down there and I started playing it. I said, wait a minute, this sounds familiar. You know what it was? It was a verse to Stardust. <laughs> <laughs> what a disappointment. <laughs>